happy to talk to you all about breast health and um, a little bit about um, my background, uh, my education. And so I thought I'll talk a little bit about that. And um, obviously breast health is a very wide topic. So um, I think what I've included hopefully will be useful to you, um, to you all. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, you can ask me in the end. So uh, let's have a look. So what I'm going to do, I'll talk a bit about my education and training. Um, as I said, breast surgery as a speciality, a bit about breast cancer, um, how we manage it surgically, and also a little bit about secondary breast disease. So um, uh, I trained in London, um, trained at the World Free Hospital, and it was around the time before it merged with UCL, now it's one entity. And yeah, I, I'm a Londoner, so I didn't really move very far, <laughs> not being very creative there. Um, but I was there for, for six years. And um, yes, as you know, London is a very expensive city, but it was a great place to learn as well. And um, in my third year, I did an intercalated BSc and um, no, you know, three guesses for what my BSc was in. You can probably guess um, I did it in biochemistry. We love the Krebs cycle, don't we? Not, but um, yeah, so I did that and um, that, was, that was quite fun. Oops, sorry. Um, and then after that, three years of further clinical work and I graduated. And you think, okay, well, that's great. Now, now what? Now, you know, I need to decide what I want to do with my life. Am I going to do medicine? Am I going to do into surgery? Not really sure. And you think that the path is going to be very straight and, you know, straightforward. You have an aim, you know where you're going, um, and you're just going to follow that path. And that um, wasn't necessarily the case for me. Um, some people know what they want to do already before they graduated. And if you're one of those um, people, then, you know, that's amazing. Um, but unfortunately for me, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So for my foundation years, um, when I was doing my equivalent of foundation years, it was called, you know, you, uh, you were doing a house officer job. Um, so my first house officer job was in respiratory medicine that was during the winter. So that was a baptism of fire for sure. That was for six months. And then after that, I did orthopedic surgery for six months. And that was, that was really fun. And that was my first exposure to surgery. And after that, I did six months of, of a &E. And I would, personally, I would highly recommend doing a &E, casualty, uh, ER, whatever you want to call it, um, if you can, because it teaches you so much. It teaches you how to um, prioritize, teaches you to um, think on your feet. Um, it, it, it's a really, really valuable experience. So if, if you can, I would suggest and highly recommend to do that. It's tough work, but it's, it's worth it. And then after a lot of soul searching, I decided to do surgery. And um, it was a lot of soul searching because at that juncture, I was still undecided as to whether I wanted to do medicine or surgery, but I bit the bullet and decided to do surgery. And so um, core surgical training is equivalent to, at the time was senior, senior house officer years or SHO jobs. And I did it. Um, again, I didn't really venture too far. Um, I stayed in London and I went to the Royal London Hospital and uh, Barts Hospital. And the Royal London now is a completely new hospital. So uh, if you can see the blue bit on behind the facade of the Royal London Hospital, that's the new uh, part of the hospital. Uh, but the facade is actually a listed, it's a listed building. So the facade has been kept. So that's, that's quite a nice thing um, to have happened. So I did course surgical training there. And as you know, you have to do your membership of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, or Edinburgh um, exam. Um, so whilst you're training, you have to do an exam as well, and you have to pass that. Um, and then I thought, oh, okay. Well, I was interested in doing some research. So then I thought, okay, let's do a little bit of research. I did a PhD. Um, in surgical oncology. I went back to the Royal Free 
um, to an old lab and um, I did a little bit of it there. Um, and then I went to, um, to Los Angeles, to the University of Southern California to continue to do that. And to be honest, that was amazing. You know, to have an opportunity to go um, to LA, look at, look, I mean, just look at that sky, it's blue sky, um, gorgeous weather, the sea, um, just, you know, by, by your side. So that was really, really interesting. And it's really interesting experience to be able to, to, to look at and experience a different healthcare system. And once you've done that, you actually appreciate how for, for, for UK based um, doctors, you know, you appreciate how amazing the NHS is actually. Um, so I did that. So I actually took three years um, out of my training. Um, and then oh, somebody needs to come in. It's okay, don't worry, I'll... I'll... Oh, you did that, okay. <laughs> and then I did um, higher surgical training. So, you know, I decided to do general surgery and, um, you know, you have to go into higher surgical training, which is for six years. And during that, those six years, um, I rotated through upper GI, vascular, colorectal and breast. And um, I then decided to do a master's in education um, surgical education because you know as doctors we are educators I would say and uh, you continue to learn and you continue to teach and I really am interested and passionate about teaching so I thought I'd do that uh, to better equip me to do to to be a better teacher so I did that um, and um, by this stage I was deciding I wanted to do breast surgery so then um, to better equip myself with the necessary skills, I did a non-coplastic fellowship. And of course, during this time, you have to do the fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons exam. So um, higher surgical training is actually, I would say, quite tough, but quite exciting because you, you have the skills already, um, you know, you're getting there slowly, uh, but you do have to, uh, you're training on the job, and you still have to learn and study for an exam. So that um, is a quite tough couple of years. Um, and, you know, around this time, uh, people are, you know, potentially having families, having kids. Um, so it's, 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 it's a tough, tough time, but it's definitely worth it because, you know, this is the path that you ultimately um, take and this is the path that I ultimately took it wasn't that straight narrow path that took me from A to B it was a very zigzaggy path that took me from A to B and um, and, th and that's okay you know and I would say the majority of um, of us have this path you know it's very rare that we have a straightforward path so now I'm a consultant surgeon and I'll show you a bit of a video Mm, I think we can't hear the video. You can't? No. Okay. All right. Well, we'll skip that then. That's a shame. Never mind. Uh, that's a bit of a come on the why. Um, anyway, this is a, a video. You can catch it on TikTok. I made it on TikTok. Um, and the Royal College of Surgeons asked me how, um, what, it, what is it like being a consultant surgeon? And so in this, I, um, I decided to, to tell um, you know, uh, people what it's like being a consultant breast surgeon. So uh, I'm now a consultant breast surgeon and um, you might think, okay, well, what decided you to choose a speciality, a speciality that is breast surgery? Um, well, first of all, you know, I trained as a general surgeon um, and that's what uh, was, I was passionate about that. Um, I wanted to do cancer surgery and breast surgery is that, you know, it's not plastic surgery. So plastic surgery is very different uh, and plastic breast surgery is very different. It's not cosmetic surgery, it is cancer surgery. Um, oncoplastic surgery, so this is a term that um, you may or may not know, but modern breast surgery now is based on oncoplastic surgical techniques. And what that means is we, um, we try to adhere to plastic surgical principles to make sure that not only we get the cancer out, but we also 
try to make sure that the aesthetic outcome of that surgery is at the highest level. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, the cancer needs to come out. So that is of utmost priority, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we give a good aesthetic result. And gone are the days where you just take the cancer out and, and that's it. We have to make sure that we give a good aesthetic outcome. Um, obviously, breast surgery is very evidence-based and protocol driven, which is very um, a very attractive thing. And you have to really enjoy clinics. You have to enjoy the uh, interactions with people and patients. Uh, if you don't like clinics, then breast surgery um, as a specialty is not for you, okay? So you need to, be, uh, to really enjoy the clinics. Um, the other good thing about breast surgery, I guess, is the patients are generally well and they're healthy. Unlike, uh, for example, say colorectal um, surgery or colorectal um, clinics or colorectal cancer, um, you, you know, patients can be quite unwell and they can have um, really debilitating symptoms. Um, in breast um, health, patients are generally very, very well. Uh, they may have breast cancer, but they're not unwell with it. And I have to say, it is a very rewarding specialty. Patients are really, really grateful. And you feel that you can make an impact on, on patients' lives. So, um, so that's why I did breast surgery. Now, so it's important, you know, for all of us, um, men included, you know, because men can get breast cancer, um, rare, but it can happen, um, for us to know what to do when we are examining our breasts. Now, um, this is a poster from Breast Cancer Care, and you can go to the website, you can um, download this. But these are the things that you need to look out for. You need to look out for changes in the breast, any change in the shape or the size obviously any lumps or dimpling, any changes in the skin or the texture, uh, a rash, especially if it's around the nipple, um, inversion of the nipple, so if the nipple is pulled in, any spontaneous nipple discharge, and pain that doesn't go away, um, and if you notice any swelling in the armpit or the collarbone. So these are the things that you need to look out for when examining your breast, and it's very, very important to be aware of that. This is probably the earliest depiction of a breast cancer. And I don't know if you can see um, in, the, uh, in the left breast of, of this woman, just in the upper inner quadrant, there's a little bit of a swelling. And we think that this may well represent a breast cancer. Um, this is uh, The Night by Michel de Rodolfo de, de Gil Girlandio, I think that's how you uh, pronounce it. And it's based on a sculpture by Michelangelo. Mid 1500s, possibly it was painted, and um, yeah, so breast cancer um, has been uh, been present for some time. So you have found a lump um, or a breast symptom or something that you're not quite sure about. Then what happens? Well, you come to the one stop breast clinic, and what happens in the breast clinic is you get what we call a triple assessment. So you will get a physical exam, you will get some. Uh, form of imaging, whether that's a mammogram or an ultrasound scan or both, and then you'll have a biopsy. Okay, so that is what triple assessment is um, includes. Um, not everybody will get a mammogram. So as I'm sure you know, uh, mammograms are usually um, reserved for the slightly older women. So that's over 40s. Um, and if you're younger than 40, then you'll just get an ultrasound scan. However, if we find something that is suspicious and you're under 40, then you may also be arranged to have a mammogram, okay? So um, if you're under 40, you don't get a mammogram. Um, if you're over 40, you get a mammogram and ultrasound scan. Um, this is what a mammogram machine looks like. Um, it looks a bit scary, but it's not that bad. Mammograms are very safe, very, um, you know, not very painful at all. Um, perhaps, you know, 20 years ago, getting a mammogram is something uh, people are fearful of, but now it's actually very, very comfortable. And I'm sure you all have seen this. This is an ultrasound scan machine, and um, this is in the clinic that I work, work in. And then we have to do a, uh, a breast biopsy, obviously, if we find something. Now I'm going to see, tell me if you can hear this. If you can't, just let me know and I'll stop a bit. Did you hear that? 
no okay so basically i'll show it to you anyway so that's the syringe with the scalpel local anesthetic vial sterile swabs a needle and the core biopsy needles so that's what we use to do a breast biopsy okay and that's the normal tray that we use very you know very simple um, the core biopsy needle looks a little bit big, looks a bit scary, but it's actually not that bad. Um, now, if you have a lump and you have a biopsy, it doesn't mean that you have cancer, okay? Um, some, you know, people think, oh God, you know, I've got something and I've had a biopsy, I must have cancer. That's not necessarily true. Um, a lot of lumps can uh, be very normal and non-cancerous. So, you can have cysts, which are non-cancerous. You can have fibroadenomas, which uh, I'm sure you know are non-cancerous, and they don't turn into a cancer. Um, sometimes though, you know, especially if you're over 25 and we see a lump um, that we're not sure what it is, then we would do a biopsy. It doesn't mean you have cancer, okay? Uh, fibroadenomas, as you all know, is a very common thing and it's the commonest cause of lumps in young women. So uh, just because you have a biopsy doesn't mean you have cancer. So that's an example of a breast cyst um, on ultrasound scan on the left. And, um, you know, that black bit is fluid um, in, in the lump. And what we do is we aspirate it with a needle and you get straw colored fluid um, aspirated there. Now, this is a cancer and this is a mammogram. Um, and if you see there's like a C little marker coil within that massive circle. That is what we deploy when we do a biopsy. Um, and that basically tells us where we've been. So when we do a biopsy, um, you know, we take the sample of the tissue out and then we replace it with the little marker coil. And you'll understand why we do that in a minute. But essentially, especially if, if we can't fill the lump, if we can fill the lump, then this may not be necessary. Um, but if we can't fill the lump, then this is something that we would we would put in. Um, that's another mammogram. And you can see um, that cancer there, very obvious. And you can also see uh, slight pulling of the nipple. Um, and that and when when people say, OK, you know, why? Why is inversion of the nipple important? Well, it's usually because there's a cancer behind it. And when the cancer grows, it causes fibrosis and it, and it pulls the skin towards itself. So um, this is um, an example of that. Okay, so that's that's the cancer on a mammogram, and this is what a cancer looks like on an ultrasound scan. Now, if you cast your mind back a couple of slides ago, uh, thought about the cyst, and compare that to this one, this doesn't look very nice. You know, it's got irregular edges. Uh, it's got. Um, it doesn't look as black as as what we looked, uh, what we saw earlier uh, with the cyst, um, and this is something that um, needs a biopsy. So this is a cancer. So um, let's talk a bit about breast cancer. Is this all right so far? Yeah? Perfect. Okay, cool. So breast cancer is the commonest cancer in women in the UK at least, okay? Um, and one in eight um, lifetime risks. So one in eight of women will get cancer in their lifetime. But as you can see, the risk increases with age. So it's, you know, it's, it's a cancer that commonly occurs as we become older. So there, when you're 29, it's one in 2000, but when you're, you know, and you're 60, it's one in 22, and then it definitely increases as, um, as you get, get older and in your 70s. We get about 350 um, cases of male breast cancer a year. Um, and, you know, we still get deaths from breast cancer, but the survival is also very good. And so in the UK, certainly it's the number one uh, cancer that uh, inflicts women. Um, and the second commonest cancer in women is lung, uh, followed by bowel. So breast cancer is very common. So if we look at um, age versus um, incidence of, of breast disease, you can see on the left that, you know, 
fibroadenomas um, is common in the younger age there, as well as abscesses. Um, and as we get older, the incidence of fibroadenoma gradually decreases. So fibroadenoma is common as, as, as you know, in young women. Um, abscesses is also common in the young, especially if you're breastfeeding. Um, and then you look at the cancer incidence. Um, it's very low, well, relatively low, and it increases as we get older. So, um, and cysts is kind of peaks and then drops. So cancer is definitely something that um, more common as we get older. That's not to say that it doesn't affect young women. It, you know, it can affect young women. And again, that's something that many people think actually, you know, I thought cancer only affects people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. No, that's not true. Cancer can affect people in their 30s, um, you know, late 20s rarely, but they can happen. Uh, but it's definitely uh, commoner as we get older. So as a reminder for um, what the anatomy of the female breast looks like, um, it's composed of lobules and ducts, okay? Uh, and this uh, is within fatty tissue and it sits against um, the muscle, which is pectoralis major muscle. Um, and this is very important to remember because this tells us where um, ca the cancer can arise from. And normally the majority of cancers arise from the ducts. So invasive ductal carcinoma uh, represents 76% of all invasive cancers. So um, the commonest breast cancer arises from the ducts within the breast. Um, and then following that, uh, the second commonest type is lobular cancer. So that arises from the lobules of the breast. And then as you go down, um, the, you know, mucinous tubular medulla with the fluid, the slightly rarer types of cancer. Now, if you look at the duct, this is the normal breast duct. Um, cancer can also be called in situ cancer. So this is where the cancer um, is confined within the ducts. And this is called DCIS, which is ductal carcinoma in situ, or LCIS, which is lobular carcinoma in situ. Uh, we normally detect DCIS or LCIS um, on imaging. So if you have a screening mammogram and you can't feel the lump, but we can see something on the mammogram, um, it, it's not uncommonly to be DCIS. Invasive cancer, of course, is, you know, by definition, it can start to invade. Um, and it breaks through the confines of the ducts. So that you have two types, in situ and invasive cancer. So, okay, you've been diagnosed with cancer. Um, how do we treat it? And I'm sure you all know that breast cancer treatment involves many, many modalities. It involves surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, endocrine treatment, Herceptin or immunotherapy, and it is really tailored to the patient's tumor biology. So um, some people may get, may get surgery, but not chemotherapy, um, and they may get radiotherapy and endocrine treatment. Some people may get all of these, um, and the sequence in which these are given can also vary. So some people may get chemotherapy first, followed by surgery, followed by radiotherapy. Um, if you have for example, a triple negative breast cancer, then you can't have endocrine therapy because there's no hormonal receptors um, um, to be affected, but uh, you'll have chemotherapy for sure. If you have a cancer that is HER2 positive, which is um, something that we can treat with Herceptin, then you will get Herceptin, but if you're HER2 negative, then you won't. So the treatment is very uh, tailored to um, patients' tumor biology, and that's why we always tell patients, you know, or discourage them from comparing their cancer to somebody else's because their cancers will be, you know, potentially be very different. Um, and so you can't compare one, one treatment to somebody else's. So I'm a surgeon, obviously, so I'll talk about breast surgery, um, if I may. Um, and broadly speaking, um, if you have uh, breast cancer in surgical terms, you either will have breast conservation surgery, so that's a wide local excision or a lumpectomy, 
or you will have a mastectomy, which is removal of the breast, or you may have mastectomy with reconstruction. Okay, so that's broadly speaking um, what surgery for breast cancer entails. Um, and, you know, you might think, okay, what are the differences between these surgical options? Well, we know that a lumpectomy with radiotherapy, there is no survival difference to somebody who has a mastectomy. Uh, and so that's why we are very confident to offer patients, you know, breast conservation surgery followed by radiotherapy. But obviously, whilst you still have a breast, there is a risk of recurrence within that breast. Okay, so lumpectomy and radiotherapy you have a risk of local recurrence of between 5 to 15 percent. If you have a mastectomy, you are not 100 percent guaranteed that the cancer will not return you can still get the cancer to return locally. Usually you see it underneath, or you can feel it underneath the flap of the, of the mastectomy. Um, but of course, the, the risk of recurrence is lower uh, than if you did have a breast, but it's still there. So um, it's important for us to remind patients that, you know, you've had a mastectomy, but it's still important to examine your, the flap um, because you can still get recurrence there. Um, and if you have DCIS, then you know you have good clinical prognosis because remember DCIS is confined to the ducts and it doesn't invade, so uh, it has a very good um, survival um, rate. So, if somebody has um, a cancer and you know they want a lumpectomy. It's something we can offer for sure, but there are certain instances where we can't um, offer somebody a lumpectomy. And th these are the uh, possible contraindications. For example, if you have uh, multicentric disease, so you have more than one cancer in the same breast, then doing two lumpectomies um, is not ideal. So in that case, you'll offer them a mastectomy or recommend them to have a mastectomy. If you have extensive uh, mammographic malignant microcalcification. So um, that would most likely represent DCIS. Um, and so breast conservation surgery would not be an option if you have inflammatory breast cancer or if you've had previous breast conservation surgery, then um, usually at this stage, we would recommend them to have a mastectomy. So this is um, a mammogram uh, of a, of a, a a patient who went for screening mammogram. So she did not have any symptoms and um, you can, you may not be able to see this, but uh, with the, uh, you know, if we had a good screen that there's some worrying macro classifications here. And here we, because we can't feel it, we need to, but we need to remove it. We have to localize it with a wire. So um, she had a wire placed under local anesthetic on the day of surgery, and the tip of the wire is essentially um, telling us where the cancer is. And so at time of surgery, we remove the specimen and we x-ray it, and we can see that that's the tip of the wire uh, within this area of cancer. And obviously the aim of, of surgery is to get a good rim of normal breast tissue around it, which I think this has been achieved. Nevertheless, we take that and then we send it to the lab so that they can have a look at it. And this is another example of um, a lumpectomy specimen. So that's the wire. That's You can obviously see that that's a cancer there. Um, these clips are placed um, at the time of surgery to tell us the orientation. So uh, because we want to know um, what sides what, you know, if we put it underneath the x-ray machine, if we don't know uh, which side is which, then um, it would be very difficult to know which side we need to remove a little bit more of. So, so for example, if the cancer is close to one of the edges, we need to know what edge that is to enable us to go back to remove a bit more of normal breast tissue. So this is uh, what we do in breast conservation surgery. Now, um, a mastectomy is a removal of the breast and obviously, there are many indications of this. Um, if you have a large tumor versus your 
uh, breast volume, obviously, you know, you'll need a mastectomy. Again, if you have um, cancers in different parts of the breast, widespread DCIS, inflammatory breast cancer. Um, if after a lumpectomy, um, you have margins and then we've removed those margins and it's still positive, then that patient will be recommended to have a mastectomy because it's very difficult to continue to remove a bit more breast tissue. At some point you just have to say, okay, I'm afraid we can't, you know, we have to, we have to unfortunately proceed with a mastectomy. If you have um, the BRCA gene mutation, um, then we can do a mastectomy as part of a risk reducing mastectomy um, um, effort. And obviously the patient's choice. Um, and we have to, you know, if, if a patient has a lump that is a cancer and would like a mastectomy, having been recommended to have breast conservation surgery, but it's fully informed um, consent, then we, uh, we will respect their wishes. Now, um, this is a mastectomy of the old days. Um, this is Halstead's mastectomy, and it's, you know, it's very uh, mutilating. You can see the underlying ribs. So you take, uh, this is, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would take the breast um, and you would take pectoralis major muscle as well. Um, we don't do that now. So this is an example of um, a patient who she actually had as you can see, bilateral mastectomy. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's much better cosmetically. Um, and she, she's decided not to have um, reconstruction out of choice. So now we are able to um, offer patients reconstruction and it's great for patients because, you know, patients may not want to live without a breast. Um, some patients don't want a, uh, a reconstruction and that's absolutely fine. But if, you, if they do, then it's something we can offer. And you can offer it either in the immediate setting, which is at the same time as the breast cancer operation, or in the delayed setting, which is after they've completed their breast cancer treatment. Um, and then, so that's in terms of the timings of your reconstruction. Um, and then in terms of what we use, you can either use an implant or use your own body tissue, which is called autologous um, reconstruction. So if you, you know, when we counsel patients uh, regarding the types of implant or autologous based reconstruction, it's a quite a complex discussion and it takes time because it's a very important decision for somebody to make. Um, and as you go up the ladder, you can see that, you know, the simplest one is at the bottom, but with time um, and as you go up, the complexity increases um, and the recovery time and surgical time increases. So an implant-based reconstruction is the simplest to do, it's quickest to recover from, um, but you will need what we call maintenance surgery because an implant won't last forever and that will need to be replaced at some point. And then if you go up the ladder, you now using your own body tissue, so you can use a latissimus dorsi um, flat, which is the back muscle that overlies your scapula. Um, and that, you know, is a longer operation, longer recovery time. And then you can use your tummy or the tram flap. So DEP, which is the deep inferior epigastric uh, perforator flap. Um, it uses the bit of the tummy that you can grab, if you like, if you have any tummy at all. Um, and you detach that from your person and we, uh, we plumb it onto the chest wall. Um, it's the longest to recover from, it's the longest of surgeries, but it feels the most natural. Um, and it's because it's your own body, body tissue. And, you know, not everybody will be suitable for implants. Not everybody will be suitable for autologous. And these are discussions we have with, with the patients. Um, if autologous breast reconstructions are usually done jointly with the breast surgeon and the plastic surgeons, um, for breast surgeons who are oncoplastically trained, then we would do um, implant-based reconstructions ourselves. So this is an implant-based reconstruction. Um, you place the implant behind pec major muscle. Okay, so that's pec major. You lift it, you put it behind pec, and then you inflate it. Um, 
Now the techniques where we actually don't put it behind pec and we just put it um, on top of pec major muscle. Um, so it's, um, you know, a lot of us are doing that as well. Um, these are different kinds of implants that you can use. So um, this kind of port here is where we insert the needle and syringe and inflate um, saline. So these two are expanders uh, with an integrated port there, and that's um, a remote port um, there. Um, and these are um, uh, non expanding implants, so they're permanent implants. What you do is you um, put the expanders in, you expand them, and then you replace them with a permanent implant, or you can put a permanent implant straight, straight in. Um, this is a DEP uh, flap breast reconstruction, uh, and you will have two scars, one kind of where a normal cesarean scar would be, but very much longer from, it usually extends from there to there. Um, and this bit of the, the skin and the fat is removed, and then we plumb it um, into one of these vessels. So you can usually plumb it into the thoracodorsal uh, recipient vessel there. Um, and that's the scar there. Your belly button actually moves up a little bit and you get a flatter tummy. Um, so sometimes some people say, oh, you know, I get a tummy tuck at the same time. If I had this breast type of breast reconstruction, um, I would suggest that's not, a, <laughs> that shouldn't be the driver to have this type of reconstruction to have a tummy tuck. Um, so, but yeah, uh, and it feels most natural actually, this kind of reconstruction. So um, I thought I'd just quickly mention um, secondary or metastatic breast cancer um, because, you know, we, this is not a, a cure. Breast cancer is not a cancer that we uh, can 100% cure. Um, and unfortunately, some do develop metastatic breast cancer. And we know that uh, for breast cancer, it would, you know, we obviously remove the central node which is the most important node in the armpit um, at time of surgery um, to see if the cancer has spread to this uh, part of the body. Um, and if they have been involved, then we'll remove all of the glands. But central lymph node biopsy, uh, central lymph nodes are very important because they are the first port of call um, for spread. This is um, an example of a CT scan and these nodules here um, are cancer deposits, um, unfortunately. This is a bone scan and, you know, I don't think you need to be particularly um, an expert in noticing that this bone scan doesn't look right at all. You can see all of these black spots um, and the ribs um, on, the, on the spine and the uh, pelvis. So um, this patient has got bone met, and this is a bone scan. And this is um, a CT scan of a liver. And here you can probably just vaguely see um, liver mets. So it's, you know, although it's very encouraging that um, survival is very good now, um, it's still unfortunate that we can't yet cure breast cancer completely. And I hope at some point that we'll be able to do that. So I hope um, that's been helpful. It's been a bit of a whistle tour um, about uh, breast cancer and health. So I talked a bit about my education and training. You can ask me anything you like about that. Uh, why breast surgery is a great specialty. Um, I'm biased, obviously, but it's, it's a good specialty to, to go into. Talked a bit about breast cancer, surgical management, and secondary disease. Um, just to just to let you know that I've got this um, podcast and um, I think Cassandra asked me to talk about it a little bit purely for um, as a resource for for you guys if you um, want to learn more a little bit more about uh, breast cancer and health um, I, there's an episode on how to examine your breast um, and I think it's if you go to mybreastmyhealth.com forward slash breast examination um, you can you can listen to me talk about how to do breast examination. And there are other things about, you know, side effects of breast cancer, surgery, um, 
the, the benefits of nutrition and exercise and um, all sorts of things. Um, and also interview uh, patients who've had breast cancer. And I think um, as a doctor, I think this, that, this has been one of the really interesting things um, to do because you learn so much more and because you, I don't have the time in my clinics to be able to, to talk to them as much as, that, that, as much as I have done for these uh, podcast episodes. So um, if you like to check it out, do check it out if, um, if you find it interesting. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, I hope that um, that has filled in a little bit of your afternoon today. <laughs> uh, apologies, I was a bit late. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've already received some questions in the chat uh, privately, but of course, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat right now. Oh, we'll answer this one first i've received a new one um it says for a widespread dcis uh, yep. you would still do a mastectomy even though ductal uh do not metastasize yes that's a very good question that's a very good question and so unfortunately at the moment we don't know what will happen if we leave dcis um and especially if it's extensive, there's always a possibility that there's some invasive cancer lurking within that sea of DCIS. Okay, so if you can imagine if somebody came with a mammogram with, you know, extensive microcalcification and we did a biopsy and it shows DCIS, well, there's all of this other microcalx within this sea of breast tissue. We can't biopsy all of them. And if it's extensive, Potentially, not all the time, but potentially there might be an invasive component in there. So that's one of the reasons. But the other reason is we don't know what will happen, um, whether high grade DCIS might um, become invasive cancer. So now, actually, we have um, a trial that is looking at um, low grade um, DCIS to see whether it's safe to um, low grade and intermediate grade, it, whether it's safe to leave alone or um, do an operation. So patients are randomized to do nothing or surgery and then being followed up um, to see if there's any difference. Um, but that's a, a great question. And yes, unfortunately, at, at this moment in time, we are doing a mastectomy. If, is that over treatment? We don't know because we're not brave enough to leave it. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, we've been receiving a lot of um, messages regarding the talk and that they're very thankful for uh, the informative uh, lecture today. Before we continue on to the rest of the questions that we have, I would really just very quickly like to also share my screen very fast, um, if that's possible, just so that I can... Um, shall I stop sharing? I'll stop sharing, yes. shall I? Yeah, sure. Um, just to inform the rest of the people about our following lectures of the month. Mm, for some reason, my slides are not working. Um, it's okay, I'll just continue on with other questions in the meanwhile. So another question we got was in regards to uh, you mostly having a surgical uh, specialty, how much time do you get to be in contact with your patients like post-operatively? Because in comparison to other specialties that are, let's say, mostly clinical, like uh, in the office, how much of the afterwards care or how, how much do you influence their post-operative care? Yeah. Um... That's a good question. So when we, after surgery, we'll see them probably once, probably. Um, sometimes because of COVID, we may not even see them after the operation. Um, we're giving results over the telephone now. Um, so it's not, you know, it's, it can be quite minimal. Um, so say for example, somebody has surgery, I give them the results over the phone. I may not see them after the operation unless they have problems. And then they will have their first contact with an oncologist for further um, treatment. They will have a breast care nurse though. 
and it's usually the breast care nurses that will um, you know provide continuity of, of care if patients have any um, underlying questions and concerns that they can communicate with the breast care nurses so they will have that care but um, for me personally I don't have that much um, contact after surgery unfortunately Okay. Okay. So I'll go back to the slides really quick, uh, just for everyone to know. Um, just gonna... um, today's lecture, we are devoting the month of April to women's health. So you can see here, we have uh, different other lectures um, lined up for the rest of the month for polycystic ovaries, as well as uh, a lecture on men's health, despite the fact that uh, the month of April was for women's health, and also an interactive uh, lecture on creating col collaborative communities within uh, the healthcare um, system and, uh, well, between medical students in our case, and other ones you can see on our social media. But I'm gonna continue on now with the rest of our questions. We have two more questions that I have noted down. Um, a person asked in compare, you said at some point about uh, placing an implant either on top of pectoralis muscle or below, what would be the determining factor as to deciding if it's gonna be on top or below the muscle? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... There's pros and cons to both, really. Obviously, if you um, do it, put it underneath pec, pec major muscle, it's more extensive surgery. Um, the benefit of that would be uh, you don't get much rippling of the implant because if you think about it, you know, you are putting an implant, there's, so the breast is gone, right? So you're putting either the implant behind pec and then over, you know, so it would be um, implant, pec, major, and skin. Or you put it over pec, which means that you'll just have skin overlying the implant. Now, if you put it that way, um, on top of pec, we would normally encase it with um, what we called um, some sort of matrix. So it's either a mesh or um, what we call an acellular dermal matrix. So it's usually denatured cow skin or um, bovine um, porcine skin um, that encapsulate that implant just to give it that extra um, layer. Um, the problem or one of the downsides of putting it over pack is rippling because there is very little um, you know padding. So um, it, it's, a, it's a discussion that you have to have with the patient um, if a patient, say, is pretty athletic, for example, and uses their pec major muscle a lot, then they may consider putting it over pec because they don't want their pec major muscle to be affected. Um, but, you know, if somebody's very, very slim um, and they don't want to necessarily feel the implant, then there may not be um, a good option. So that's a good question. Um, also, it depends on the surgeon's. Um, you know, expertise as well, uh, because not everybody are doing, uh, you know, putting putting the implant over PEC at the moment. Um, but it, that's a good that's a good question. Perfect, thank you. And uh, I have one more question, if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Also, the rest of the people, if uh, you have any other questions, feel free to add them in the chat box or message me directly. I received this uh, message. I wrote it down in the beginning of the lecture. It says, Dr. Tasha, thank you so much for your lecture today. Um, what is your opinion on people getting a mastectomy for preventive reasons and genetic predisposition? Is it something that you would encourage your patients to go on, go through or not uh, until there's shown symptoms? Yeah. Um, so if somebody is deemed to be high risk um, because they carry the BRCA1, BRCA2 um, gene mutation carrier, um, then their risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime is high. You know, it could be anything between 70, 75%. That's not a, a small number. 
Um, and it's, it is patient's choice, you know, it's that individual's own decision. Um, I was just listening to actually um, a podcast today about somebody whose grandmother died. So, she, you know, there's obviously BRCA in the family. Grandmother died of uh, breast cancer. Her mother died at the age of 40, um, early 40s of breast cancer. Um, she said, well, there obviously is a gene, you know, something not quite right in, in the genes here. She got tested. She tested positive And she said, look, I want to take control of my life. I don't want to go through what, what my grandmother had gone through, my mother had gone through. I, want to, I don't want to die of breast cancer. So in her mind, she w wants to take as much control as possible. And so she underwent prophylactic risk-reducing mastectomy. Um, and that's her choice. You know, um, there are other people who find that really difficult. They don't want to lose their breasts. They, um, they would, instead of having surgery, they would do other things like having intensive um, annual surveillance scans, you know, um, uh, and things like that. So it's a personal choice is the honest truth. Um, and it's something that, you know, involves a lot of complex discussions. Um, if somebody is very, very driven to have it done and they'll have it done, um, if they're not, then we, you know, we try to be there for them to help as much as, that, as we can to, to help them decide as to what they want to do, because it's a big decision. You know, um, if you think about it, they don't have cancer. They may not get cancer or they haven't got cancer yet. So that, you know, we are, uh, removing, I guess, um, healthy breasts, but they are at high risk of developing cancer. So um, it's an individual choice. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for your time. It was lovely. Uh, we have already received very positive feedback and a lot of people that have been very thankful for your time. Um, I'm very glad to have had you today and I would like to wish everyone a great rest of the weekend. Uh, if you have the time uh, for the people that attended our lecture today, uh, if you could let us know how it, it was for you guys today, give us some feedback. I have left a uh, feedback form in the chat box below. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, ready. thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, good luck to everybody. Um, you guys obviously amazing because, you know, on a Saturday you took the time out to, um, to, to listen to somebody like me. So I'm <laughs> grateful that you're staying and you stayed. But, you know, you're clearly motivated people. Um, good luck to whatever it is that you do and all the best. And, yeah, enjoy, enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a nice presentation. Oh, no problem. Take care, everybody.